Latvia celebrates its 100th anniversary. Everything is so beautiful in Latvian's capital, in Riga. The streets are full of flags. Guards of honor stand at the Freedom Monument. Visitors enjoy taking photos. The architecture is modern and European. This is what the words liberty, democracy and statehood stands for. Today, all it seems so quite natural, but only 100 years ago, it wasn't so. On 18th of November 1918, the Declaration of Independence was read in the building of National Theatre. It seemed so unreal. Thousands of people of different ethnic origins participated in the construction of the Latvian state. Some did more, some less, but the goal became a reality because they did it together. Hand in hand, they went towards the same goal. Later, this independency was lost for 50 years. Red Russia could not accept the existence of new neighbor, neighbor that chose democracy and not communism. In the year 1990, finally people again came together, joined forces and hand in hand re-established the Latvian independency. Some did more, some less, but again, they managed it because they did it together. Also, the local Jews took part in creation of the independent state in 1918 alongside Latvians. They fought the communism, they built the economy, took part in the government bodies of the new state. However, almost nothing is known about them, about their life. During the 50 years of Soviet occupation, the leaders did their best to erase the history of the first independence of Latvia. The notion of liberty and democracy did not fit into the framework of the communist ideology. The era of the first Latvian independency, between 1918 and 1940, was marked by flourishing journalism, free society, many journalists, many newspapers and magazines in Latvian, Russian, German and of course in Hebrew as well. In the National Library of Latvia we can find a collection of the newspaper Jaunaka Zinas, dated to 1918. Here is a copy dated to November 19th, contained the news that the National Council of Latvia, which will become later the Parliament, announced the creation of an independent state just the day before. Those news weren't a headline or a huge letters, something that is impossible to imagine our days. The text, so mundane, plain, is Nothing special happened. We informed that on November 19th, the creation of the Latvian state took place. Now Zemgale, Vidzeme and Latgale are the territories of Latvia. And then of course, the creation of an electoral system. Adherence to human rights and other democratic, very important components. A representative of the Jewish party Agudat Israel who supported the Latvian independency, Mordechai Dubin, was included in the National Council, which declared Latvian independency. Mordechai Dubin, a rabbi, was only 29 years old when Latvia became independent. However, he already was a millionaire. He was highly respected in the Jewish community and became its leader when Latvian state chose a democratic path. Just like today, Latvia has always been a multicultural society. We, uh, not only Latvians and Leaves, but also Baltic Germans, uh, Russians, people from Belarus, and of course Jewish people were uh, represented in a Latvian society. So it was only naturally that around uh, five members of, uh, of Latvian parliament uh, before uh, uh, the Second World War was Jewish. And uh, the most uh, famous Latvian uh, statesman uh, from this time was uh, Mordechai Dubins. Uh, 
Mordechai Dubin was a very religious man. He, he was a rabbi, and as a rabbi, he was very concerned about the Jewish people in his community. Uh, in 1919, the situation of the Jewish people in Riga was not very good. The Jewish people were very poor at the time. Uh, Riga, the capital of Latvia, had been taken over by the Bolsheviks. And when, for example, when the Passover holiday came around and the Jewish people needed special flour for matzah, it was absolutely unavailable, impossible to find. And Rabbi Dubin, with great dedication, actually under threat of death from the Bolsheviks, he managed to organize a distribution of matzah. Mordechai Dubin co-authored a law that does not have any equivalent in European legislation. In 1922, he introduced a draft law on granting a Latvian citizenship on one's pledge. On request of any of the hundred members of parliament, including Dubin himself, Latvian citizenship could be granted to any foreigner. On pledge that the applicant lived in Latvia before 1918, before the independency. Using this new law, Dubin managed to make several hundred Soviet Jews and Russians citizens of Latvia. When Rabbi Dubin joined the parliament uh, as a newcomer, uh, he met Carlos Ulmanis, and they found common ground uh, in one certain area. Rabbi Dubin, we have to remember, he, for ideological reasons, needed to help the Jewish people to avoid the charms of the Bolshevik ideology. And he would do everything he could to help the Jewish people uh, overcome or survive, escape from that Bolshevist uh, ide ideology. Carlos Olmanis was also a violent anti-communist for his own reasons. But because uh, Rabbi Dubin was helping so many Jewish people to avoid and escape that, uh, he helped and, and approved of this. Although it needs to be mentioned that Rabbi Dubin's primary concern here was to help the Jewish people. And he helped those Jews, some of them, even to escape prison, even though they were, in fact, Bolshevik sympathizers. For him, the most important point was to help the Jewish people. Раф Дубин, можно сказать, спас мою бабушку, да. Как-то ее подруги попросили ее, значит, расклеить листовки. Расклеить листовки в школе. Она не вдаваясь в подробности, что это за листовки, что это такое и чем это грозит. Если просят, надо делать. Она пошла и расклеила. И полиция ее поймала и посадила в тюрьму. Моя прабабушка Голда, Голда Гершевна, пошла к Дубину и его попросила помочь. Через две недели бабушку выпустили. In 1927, in the Soviet Union, it was a peak of anti-religious actions. The Bolsheviks abolished faith in God. Churches and synagogues are being demolished. Thousands of priests are arrested and shot. Rabbi Yosef Itzhak Schneerson, the sixth Chabad Lubavitcher Rebbe, a cult figure in the Hasidic movement, could not escape this fate. A Jewish spiritual leader could not accept the revolution and the godlessness in it. Of course that the Bolsheviks arrested him and might kill him as well, if not for the fear from negative reaction of the West. Back then, the Soviet Union really wanted good diplomacy with Europe and the United States. Here in the Latvian parliament, not only all acts of local legislation must be passed, but also all the international uh, treaties uh, must be voted upon when uh, Latvia is a participant. So, uh, back in 1920s, uh, the communist regime in Russia grew ever more bloody ever more bloodthirsty and ever more aggressive. Uh, naturally, some members of Siam came up with a solution. What if we tried to negotiate with them? And what if we have uh, uh, 
if we had a chance to open a peaceful trade relationship, that uh, trade treaty was drafted and uh, it was uh, signed both by Moscow and both uh, here in Riga. And now the treaty must, uh, had to be passed uh, and voted uh, here in, uh, in Saima. In the end, the fate of the new treaty was decided by only one vote. Rabbi Dubin actually saw an amazing opportunity here. He saw an opportunity to offer a bargain to the government in Moscow. The bargain would be to exchange his vote for a trade agreement in exchange for the government in Moscow to free the Lubavitcher Rebbe. And as a matter of fact, when the first vote came up in the parliament, Rabbi Dubin voted against the trade agreement. He wanted to send a message that this was a bargain. And if they would free the Rebbe, then in the next time the vote come up, he would vote for it and cause the, the agreement to go forward. The morning newspaper, Kuzemes Vards, dated to June 3rd, 1927. In the upper left corner, in a tiny note, it says, the trade agreement with the USSR is not included yet. It needs to be written in two languages, Russian and Latvian. Therefore, it will take more time. It is expected that the contract will be signed today or tomorrow. As a result, the contract between the Latvian government and the Kremlin was signed in Moscow the evening of June 2nd. It meant that Mordechai Dubin was successful to negotiate with the Soviets. And now, all that we need is to wait for the Soviets to fulfill what they promise, to release the Lubavitcher rabbi, Yosef Itzhak Schneerson, to Latvia. But instead, the Soviet court sentenced Rabbi Yosef Itzhak Schneerson to a three-year exile in Siberia. Rabbi Dubin spent the summer of 1927 with an intense trips between Riga and Moscow, trying to negotiate his bargain with the Kremlin. Uh, unfortunately, uh, he had to keep coming back to Riga uh, empty-handed. He was not able to solidify the bargain that he was trying to make, uh, his vote for the trade agreement in exchange for the Lubavitcher Rebbe's freedom. But very fortunately, uh, finally, he did manage to uh, cut the bargain with the Kremlin and the Rebbe was freed. And in, in October of that year, 1927, not only was the Rebbe given uh, freedom and opportunity to leave the Soviet Union, but the government actually bought him his train tickets to leave and he came to Riga. On September 2nd, 1939, just a day after the start of the Second World War, all the leading newspapers came out with a special declaration by the president, Carlis Ulmanis. Here it is. I declare that during the war between foreign countries, Latvia will remain neutral. Of course, that after this declaration, we understand that if so far we had only dozens of refugees coming into Latvia. Now we can expect thousands of them, most of them Jews. For them there is no chance to survive under the occupied territories by the Nazis. In the newspaper Kuzumes Vards, dated to September 19, 1939, says the following. On the afternoon of Sunday, the first groups of refugees, individuals and whole groups, crossed the Polish-Latvian border. Mordechai Zdubins had a very great personal relationship with uh, President Ulmanis, and uh, what they did, uh, Latvia was actually the last European country that took uh, Jewish refugees uh, uh, when they were flooding uh, uh, Austria and Germany and other countries taken over by the Nazi regime. Uh, Latvia gave uh, around uh, 3,000 temporary passports uh, to those uh, Jewish uh, uh, nationals uh, who were uh, fleeing uh, Austria, Soviet Union, Nazi Germany and uh, other um, less unfortunate countries. 
Jews from occupied Europe needed not only asylum, but also a shelter and food. Mordechai Dubin established a refugee relief foundation and financed it himself. He put the refugees in Jewish families and rented wooden houses in Katlakans on the left side of the Daugava River. He also created workplaces and gave the possibility to study and acquire a new profession. My dad, Felix Lipner, was born in Austria, in Vienna. Then I went to live in Czechia, in Prague. And in 1938, when the Jews were in the Evreev, he fled to Latvia. Благодаря тому, что Раф Дубин заступился за него, как и за всех беженцев, он тоже смог остаться, как и все они. Кроме всего этого, Раф Дубин и еврейская община обеспечивали этих беженцев каким образом? Они их распределяли по еврейским семьям, куда они ходили кушать. Получается, что сам того, не желая, Рав Дубин был сватом моей бабушки и моего дедушки. Личность Дубина, она для меня с детства имеет какую-то сакральную, какой-то сакральный смысл. Да? И я, меня всегда интересовало, что это был за человек такой. Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson, the, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, once again he found himself uh, under peril, this time from the Nazis, having es previously escaped from the Bolsheviks. He was now in Poland in 1937. He had moved the Lubavitch Center to Poland, and uh, now he found himself uh, under peril from the Nazis. But really, a great opportunity had sent itself from heaven many years before. In 1927, Rabbi Schneerson, the, L the Lubavitcher Rebbe, had acquired Latvian citizenship. And the Germans were under agreement that they were f required to oblige any Latvian citizen free passage to leave from under their uh, occupation. And Rabbi Dubin spent uh, those months tirelessly and relentlessly imploring the foreign ministry to force the Germans to um, provide their uh, part of the agreement, which they had signed an agreement that any Latvian citizens would be given free passage. And in fact, uh, he was successful, Rabbi Dubin, and the Rebbe was given passage out of occupied Poland back to Riga. With the help of Mordechai Dubin and many, many others, Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak Schneerson, the sixth Chabad Lubavitch Rebbe, managed to get out of the Nazi hell. He arrived first to Riga, but then he continued and went to the United States. On the 23rd of June, 1940, Rabbi Schneerson arrived to New York in the steamship Drontingholm Svagli. He was met by hundreds of journalists and thousands of American Jews. It was a miracle for everybody. The Jewish spiritual leader that managed to get out of warring Europe. Quite importantly, the rabbi brought with him a part of the famous collection of ancient Jewish manuscripts. In 1927, they were not confiscated by the Bolsheviks, unaware of their value. In 1939, they were not taken away by the Nazis who probably overlooked the boxes with the sacred Jewish manuscripts in the turmoil. In the United States, the rabbi purchased a house in Brooklyn on 770 Eastern Parkway. And since that time, this house became the world center for the Chabad movement. The newspaper Kuzemes Vards dated to June 18, 1940. On the first page, in huge letters, we see the president addressed the people. And I quote, 
The events of the last 24 hours have affected the minds of all people. Soviet troops entered our land in the morning. Those events will bring change into our peaceful way of life. The beginning of the message was alarming, but then it became more assuring. And I want to quote from inside, stay where you are and I stay at my place. Eventually it looks very peaceful. The very same newspaper, Kozumes Vards, that published the president's address to the people that was issued so successfully during the independence of Latvia ceased to exist only two days after this publication. At first, the Soviets, they simply closed all the liberal publications and they did it very simply. They just needed to shut the journalists, the editors and replace them with their own people, those who are loyal to them. When Hitler invaded Poland, later Stalin took over three Baltic countries, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania. What happened uh, was uh, military occupation in the middle of the 1940. And uh, one year later, on June 20, 1941, more than 15,000 Latvians and also Latvian Russians, Latvian Jewish and uh, other people, they were kidnapped by the Stalinist secret police, they were uh, jailed, they were uh, put in the animal cages and they were deported uh, to Siberia, to Gulag for slave work. And many of them died and perished. Mordechai Dubin was arrested by the Bolsheviks on February 1941. This was to be expected. He was a rabbi, a millionaire and an anti-communist. In 1919, he managed to escape execution. He used ruse to exchange the Lubavitcher Rebbe and procured residence permits for Jewish refugees from the USSR. Rabbi Dubin had no chance to survive the communist mid-grinder. For almost half a year, he was kept in the KGB prison known as the Corner House and sent to Siberia on the eve of the Nazi arrival to Riga. You know, ironically, the Bolsheviks actually saved Rabbi Dubin's life. They arrested him in Riga and exiled him to Siberia. And he was stuck in Siberia uh, at the time when the Nazis occupied Riga and uh, they hunted down all the Jews. They killed all the Jews here. Rabbi Dubin actually was saved because he was in Siberia at the time. Unfortunately, his entire family, which was here in Riga, uh, was killed along with 70,000 Latvian Jews at the time. You can see here in the museum uh, pictures of some of those that were sacrificed here in Riga along with another 30,000 Jews from Europe. Rabbi Dubin was released in 1945, immediately after the end of the war. However, he did not stay free for a long time. Several months later, he was imprisoned again on the charges of organizing an anti-Soviet Jewish nationalist organization. Dubin never saw freedom again. Rabbi Mordechai Dubin died on January 12, 1953 in the psychiatric clinic of the city of Tula, where he spent the last three years of his life. He was treated there only because being a Jew. He refused to eat non-kosher food, he refused to work on Saturdays, and he observed other customs. All this was, in the eyes of the Bolsheviks, a mental disease. Dubin was killed by too much doctoring. Later, it would become a normal Soviet practice to put dissidents into mental institutes. Such was the treatment of known dissidents such as Bukowski and Sharansky. Mordechai Dubin was buried in the Jewish cemetery in Tula. However, he did not immediately find sanctuary even after death. In 1985, Tula authorities decided to demolish the Jewish cemetery and Dubin's remains had to be evacuated.
Ну, было это все в середине 80-х годов. В тогдашней советской Москве была, даже не скажу община, но круг соблюдающих евреев. Одним из руководителей этой группы был Рэб Гейч Велинский. Именно он пригласил меня и рассказал о том, что есть такое указание от Любавического Рэбы, того лидера движения, который тогда был, Минах Мендель Шнейрсон, о том, что нужно перенести могилу некого Мордыхая Дубина. Мордыхая Дубина из города Тулы, поближе в какое-нибудь еврейское место, в еврейское кладбище, где можно будет собирать хотя бы раз в год миньян для того, чтобы читать кадыш, молитву поминальную раз в год. Я обратился к тамошнему председателю, заявив о том, что мне нужно перенести э, могилу останки моего дяди из Тулы, где мы уже давно не живем, э, поближе к дому, то есть в Малаховку. Я жил рядом в Люберцах, это 10 минут на езды на электричке. А рано утром, где-то в районе 5 часов, я, э, Леня Фрейверт и Урика Мышов на грузовике, э, взяв большой ящик, э, мы отправились в Тулу, опять проделали те же 200 километров и начали копать. Когда мы выкопали эту яму, мы увидели, мы увидели его, мы увидели гроб, приподняли даже доску, но на наших глазах это все рассыпалось. Only after the fall of the Soviet Union in 1991 it became possible to learn the circumstances of Dubin's death and access the protocols of his interrogations. As it turns out, he could mitigate his fate had he made penance for organizing the emigration of the 6th Lubavitch Rebbe and several thousands more Jews. But he refused and did not enter a plea bargain. Latvia celebrates its 100th anniversary. Riga, the native city of Mordechai Dubin, is currently a center of European tourism, annually visited by two and a half million people. Citizens of Latvia do not need visas anymore to travel in whole Europe. Thousands of students from everywhere in the world study in Riga's universities those days. Nobody is persecuted for his ideology or religious conviction. Ten of ethnic groups live in Latvia today. They have become a part of this country and its new history. Perhaps this is how Mordechai Dubin imagined Latvia back in 1918, when the groundwork of the future independency was laid. He probably thought about centuries of independence, about continuity of culture from one generation to another. However, all this was soon disappeared by the 50 years of the Soviet occupation. Dubin's name disappeared from people's memory during those years. Today, almost nobody in Riga remembers who was Mordechai Dubin, what did he do, or what kind of person he was. It was impossible to establish a list of names of those Jews who saved by Dubin. We cannot even say how many were there. All we know is an approximate figure of 3,000 people. He didn't keep accounting of rescued people. He was interested not in figures, but in individual human lives. Remember his name. His name is Mordechai Dubin. <laughs>